对的。啊，可以。<咳>我 set， 呀。Hi Liu， can you、Hi. hear me？ Yes， yes， Professor Liu， can hear you well。Thank you。Sound。Oh， right。Where is that？ Hold on a minute。No problem. I can hear you well. Li 老师，我这边好像现在听不到您声音Hi, Leo. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, I can hear you now. That's good. Very thank good. you. Thank you, Professor Lee. Okay. So <laughs> sorry for the delay. So good to see you again. We haven't met for really a long time. My pleasure. Yeah. So,、uh, Professor Vicky, Victoria Lee, do you want to come and say hi to Leo? <laughs> so, say hello. Hi, Vicky. Hello. Nice to see you again. Yes, very nice seeing you. <laughs> okay, so I think we'll get started. This is our third、um, lecture in the series.、Uh, this is、um, the third lecture of the C Stick Distinguished Lecture Series in Translation Studies.、Um, the first two lectures were on.、Um, More on sort of written translation. The first one on subtitling, and second one on translating、uh, Chinese martial arts. So today we changed the sort of subject matter a little bit to focus more on interpreting. So as you can see from the title of tonight's talk, is self practice and continuous professional development for conference interpreters.、Um, Professor Vicky Lee and I met、um, our speaker uh, Liu, uh, Liu Liu、uh, uh, two or three years ago,、yeah. and we had plans to to do something、uh, on professional development for prospective、uh, interpreters. But because of the、uh, pandemic, so、um, that project was sort of put on hold. But、um, Because we don't really know when this will, this pandemic will will will, will end, you know, or whether it will end、uh, at all.、Um, so we thought it would be good to invite Liu to speak to us on interpreting, and、uh, particularly on the、uh, really how to become、uh, a conference interpreter after you've got your degree from a training program.、And、I think that's something that we all wonder because we are here. You know, we 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 to become professional or、uh, conference interpreters, we have the desire, the aspiration to become conference interpreters, and we do study very hard in these programs. But then, once we get our degree, how do we really, you know,、um, hit the ground and running, you know, as a conference interpreter? And that is something we probably all will find very useful. And that's the topic that、um, uh, Liu is going to speak on. Tonight, so we're very, very pleased to have 
uh, Leo with us. Uh, a little bit uh, background information about Leo. Uh, we actually uh, include that in our poster. So you should have uh, know a bit about Leo. But for our online um, uh, audience uh, who probably haven't really read that poster or haven't really got access to that poster, let me just uh, read the short bio uh, of uh, Leo and then I'll give the floor to Leo. Okay. So uh, Mr. Liu, 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 okay, uh, is an IAC conference interpreter based in Hong Kong. Okay. Uh, right, based in Hong Kong. And he is a member of the IAC Asia Pacific Regional Bureau and serves. Right, and he serves as a representative for the Asia Pacific region on the IAC Advisory Board. He's also the global coordinator of IAC Vega Network. This is a very interesting and important position. Basically, I think um, is I think Neil will tell you more. Maybe I, I won't uh, uh, explain, but it's really to help you uh, become truly. Um, a conference of interpreters. Um, he's also the, um, right, his clients include investment banks, public companies, and government agencies. He also works for international organizations like uh, UNESCAP and the FAO. He received his master's degrees in translation and inter interpreting from Hong Kong Polytechnic University in 2011 and earned his master's degree in interpreting training at the University of Geneva in 2021. He has been a member of the International Association of Conference Interpreters, IAC, since 2017. Uh, apart from um, you know, working as a professional interpreter, he also teaches at the Department of Translation Interpreting and Intercultural Studies of Hong Kong Baptist University. So he's got you know, experience in um, interpreting and also training interpreters. And he's particularly interested in helping uh, prospective would-be interpreters become true um, interpreters on the market. So without further ado, I will um, give the floor to Liu. So uh, let's put our hands together to express a big welcome to Liu. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Lee, for the kind introduction. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me and see me well. Um, a very big thank you to uh, the University of Macau and CSTIC, or, or CISTIC. I don't know if the acronym um, is right. Um, I, As Professor Lee said, we met in the good old days before the pandemic. That was in 2019. And I... And, actually have the fond memories of having this uh, nice dinner with uh, Professor De Fong Li and Vicky Lee at the university uh, restaurant, and it was a hearty dinner. And well, I will not repeat the introduction part because Professor Lee did it very well. And um, apart from that, I just want to add that AIC Vega Network is the branch of this association dedicated to uh, engaging with young interpreters and interpreting students, um, because this is not a webinar on AIG. I will not go much more into that, but if you are interested, feel free to visit uh, the website uh, of AIG, uh, which is aiic.org, and you can find uh, our landing page of Vega Network by a simple search. So as promised, this will be a one hour uh, or roughly one hour talk. And um, after that, we can leave some time for questions, probably 30 minutes or more, uh, just to make this webinar more interactive. I think we all miss this interaction, albeit uh, not face to face. Um, before I start, just a disclaimer, I will be using some video clips in my talk um, in some case studies. And I promise they're all from publicly available resources. So there is not any confidentiality issue. 
Um, I would not try to share my slides and hope you can see it. Okay. Great. Um, I don't know how uh, we can leave a comment or, or uh, make use of the chat room because this is a live broadcast event and there are not too many people in this Zoom room. Uh, but I believe uh, Professor Lee and his colleagues will help you uh, help me manage the comments. Well, anyway, if you have a comment, leave it um, anytime. Um, so I hope you can see my slides. This is the title of my um, presentation. As you can see, it's a very practical topic. So this is uh, by no means a an academic talk. And um, so before to start with this broad topic of interpretive practice and professional development, um, I would start my talk by quoting uh, one of the most famous American football coaches, uh, Vince Lombardi, who said, practice does not make perfect, only pr perfect practice makes perfect. A bit like a tongue twister, but you know what we mean. So what matters is not the practice in itself, but the quality of practice. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm going to give you a comparison between classroom practice and real world uh, interpreting assignment. Um, actually, I could still remember my very first interpreting assignment as a freelance interpreter. I was actually taken aback by how difficult and stressful uh, this real world assignment could be. Um, I was asked to interpret a presentation on a rare topic, which was about a geography and land surveying. And I had to read like 20 articles um, and I had to read till 3 a.m. Uh, in the morning. And on, on the next day, I had to interpret starting at nine o'clock. Um, so the real world assignments could be more crude than we thought. Uh, if you look at classroom practice, on the other hand, there are often speeches of short duration, like in an interpreting session, you will probably um, be asked by your trainer to do a seven minute or um, 10 minute uh, simultaneous interpretation practice, or um, you do a consecutive practice, but in segments. Um, and they are all in a controlled environment, meaning we have these pedagogical speeches, as we call. So these speeches are probably delivered by trainers, uh, not real speakers, and they're all well selected, no accent or very light accent, uh, not many difficult technical terms. And uh, these speeches are probably uh, those uh, coming from very common topics rather than specific industrial topics. And you will also receive all round feedback, everything like from accuracy to completeness, from expression, linguistic performance to delivery. So it covers everything. But um, I'm not saying that classroom practice would be plain sale. It's not that easy because in classroom practice, you have sort of peer pressure, which is not very much seen in real world assignments. Because if you go to a conference, uh, working as a professional interpreter, the only one who will monitor your performance in a systemic way would be your booth mate, the one who is working together in the booth. And that is much less peer pressure. But in the classroom, when you interpret, you have like 10 students, 30 students, classmates watching you interpret or more precisely listen to you interpret and your trainer will be giving you feedback. So this sorts of being surrounded by your classmates and the, and the trainer and peer feedback will add to the pressure uh, of the already very stressful job of SI. But in real assignment, um, on the other hand, uh, there are always longer speeches. Um, well, if you watch um, a very popular TV program, Toko uh, Xiao uh, Dahui, you would probably heard the host Li Dan say, like everyone can tell um, a, a 
a stand-up comedy for like five minutes. This is true for interpreting as well. Interpreters are simply people who can work between two languages, and you can do that even if you haven't learned anything about interpreting. But professional interpretation probably would be something else. Uh, just because you can interpret a spe speech of five minutes doesn't mean that you can interpret 30 speeches in a long day, uh, afternoon and morning sessions. And in real world assignments, there are different emergencies. Perhaps you will not receive the script beforehand. Uh, the sound quality will unexpectedly deteriorate, which happens a lot in these days, given uh, the prevalence of remote conferences. And you will expect very little feedback from your client. Well, your client is either happy or unhappy with the interpreter's performance, but they can't explain why their performance is good or not good. Or they would probably pick on just one factor uh, or uh, uh, more, more often specific mistakes that the interpreters made. Uh, just to give this uh, patchy comments, if you like. And there are all sorts of very uh, peculiar uh, client demands. Because I remember one time I was asked by the client to interpret for a group of Chinese entrepreneurs. And the organizer said, well, Leo, you have to, uh, if I can say in Chinese, 把这些中国企业家的气势翻出来. Like you need to get across the power and eloquence of these Chinese entrepreneurs. Well, this is quite a fuzzy requirement. You, you could not grasp um, what the client really means. But on the other hand, uh, clients from other sectors, uh, for example, if you're working at a medical conference, maybe the priority would be to give accurate uh, medical terms and eloquence or power might, might not be um, on the uh, top of their list of concerns. So classroom practice and real world assignments are arguably so different. And that means we need to um, make sure that continuous practice is part of our life even after leaving this program that you are all studying in. Um, and after leaving this program, you will of course land different jobs uh, one of you might be a government interpreter and the other might be an interpreter in a big financial conglomerate and you will be expecting to uh, work in different sectors. One does a lot of medical meetings and the other um, because um, he or she has a degree in uh, law studies uh, so they land a job in a law firm. Well, there are different options and they will expect different clients' demands and um, other requirements. So that means this huge uh, diversity of the real world interpreting will warrant some specific practice in different interpreting skills. So I'm gonna give you this slide just to uh, get your thinking uh, cap on. Uh, when we are talking about conference interpreting, are we really talking about the same thing? Because if you look at this um, round shape on the left side, uh, this is an interpreter working at the United Nations. And as you probably know, UN speeches are interpreted in a way which is closer to oral translation rather than interpretation. And these are carefully worded speeches and there must be precise terms and their equivalents. For example, Yan Zheng Kang Yi would be probably a large a stern protest and there cannot be much more options. Um, if, if the speaker uh, delivers a speech and particularly used three carefully selected adjectives, you must get, get them across instead of just giving the audience two of them. So this sort of UN style speech is one thing, but on the other side, you have this uh, consecutive interpreters working with the uh, foreign ministry of China. And in that circumstances, uh, under that circumstances, perhaps political discourse uh, will be the top concern 
you need to know what line to take, you need to use precise phrase. And the best thing of these interpreters is that they have a huge uh, team of translators uh, working behind the scenes, offering support uh, to the interpreters working at the front line. The set phrases, their equivalent translation in Chinese or English, and, and they have to be very politically sensitive. Uh, for example, Taiwan Winti would be Taiwan question instead of Taiwan issue, I'm sure you all know. And if you work in a different environment, like the Legislative Council of Hong Kong, Li Fa Hui, and uh, what you will expect to deal with is these uh, parliamentary debates. Um, they're very fast, and they're dense, and they're fast due to the time limit because each parliamentarian uh, will um, want to impress their uh, electorates from the constituency. So they will do these impromptu speeches um, or, or they will do the speeches from the text, but the texts are not provided be beforehand. Um, so they, they tend to use very flowery and colorful language, uh, a lot of cross-cultural communication because, you know, in Hong Kong, most of these parliamentarians uh, speak Cantonese, and there is a huge cultural barrier between Cantonese and English. Um, sometimes there are uh, all sorts of witty languages and, and, and quips, uh, like uh, recently in, in a parliamentary debate, uh, there was one legislator who um, misquoted Li Bai's uh, poem to describe how difficult uh, resuming this uh, cross-border travel would be. So uh, he said, So, uh, and on the spot, you have to think about that. Well, should I keep this uh, misquote? Should I keep this color of the language? Uh, or should I uh, drop it by just giving a plain uh, translation by saying uh, it's hard to resume cross-border uh, travel? And there were... Um, uh, legislators who quoted Bible or analects, uh, and that would be a nightmare for, for interpreters, because if you didn't remember the exact words, it was impossible for you to interpret on the spot. So um, in this kind of situation, sometimes we need to uh, avoid a mindset of looking for the precise translation, because there can't be an equivalent to each and every phrase expression. Because uh, if you do that, you might be uh, what we call penny wise and pound foolish. Uh, you, 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 you get the punchline, you got across that, and you, you uh, rest on the laurels. But uh, the second uh, sentence and the third sentence, you miss them all. And this is... Uh, quite the opposite of what the interpreters were supposed to achieve. So um, these are some emerging trends in conference interpreting. Um, as you know, conference interpreting is basically used in every and each industry. Well, previously, it was the thing for uh, political speeches, um, diplomatic events, UN conferences, etc. But now it's in every and each industry. And that means uh, industries from medical, pharmaceutical to, to uh, new energy vehicles, uh, PV, uh, battery, everything you can think about will be probably uh, sub-markets for interpreting. And um, there are all sorts of industry jargons, uh, as you probably understand, because uh, sometimes you prepare a conference and you look up these terms in the dictionary, but it turns out that in real life, people speak another language. Uh, for example, um, an expert in financial industry, if they are talking to an audience, um, speaking a different language, and when they mention uh, these financial terms like MLF and SLF, uh, like meet, uh, uh, mid-term uh, lending facilities and short-term lending facilities. Uh, if they are doing this as an inside talk, meaning they're talking to their colleagues in China, 
but they didn't realize that they there were interpreters working for them, interpreting their words into English uh, to the other um, uh, to to an audience speaking a different language. And uh, in in Chinese uh, financial industry, there were this interesting sayings for these two terms. Uh, Originally, they meant 中期借贷便利 or 短期借贷便利, but MLF and SLF uh, um, were often uh, translated as 酸辣粉 and 麻辣粉. So if they said 酸辣粉 and 麻辣粉, uh, the interpreter had to make a quick decision on what these words were and then uh, and, uh, get the meaning across to uh, the foreign audience. Um, and it all depends on if the speaker knows that he or she is talking to a different audience, speaking to a different language. And this inside talks exist a lot in industries like uh, gaming, uh, sports, um, and medical industry, of course, and, and other uh, subsectors. And there are also situations like interpreting for people working in the same company. Well, these people, their colleagues, they may come from different branches of the same company located at different parts of the world. They speak um, different languages, but they have some internal jargons. They have um, some even inside jokes that only people from this company can understand. And this will also make the interpreter's job extremely difficult. Uh, remote speakers, as we are doing now, I am a remote speaker. Um, of course, I managed to uh, improve my sound quality to the maximum uh, level that I could achieve. But um, I, I think colleagues who um, work in this profession know very well that nowadays remote speakers are notoriously hard to be heard. And this poor sound quality is a striking problem People are not using proper microphone, where they're just not aware of how important sound could be in remote meetings. Um, or they are probably just not aware how they sound, because if you lose internet connection or if your microphone suddenly drops, you probably have no idea. Um, I'm sure you all feel the pain of working remotely, because we've gone through uh, these things remote conferences, remote webinars, remote teaching classrooms, since we were plunged into a, a world of lockdowns, PCR tests, uh, working from home, etc. Um, but we have to do everything to defend our working conditions at all costs. Um, but sometimes in extreme situations where we need to work under this special uh, circumstances, we must think of special techniques uh, so we can uh, do that comfortably, which uh, I will talk about later. Fast speeches. Um, in this world of remote conferences, there are uh, some events which not uh, which did not use uh, real speakers, but pre-recorded videos. We know pre-recorded videos are arguably very different from impromptu speeches. They're fast, they're dense, because they're reading from script rather than talking uh, um, uh, uh, free up the cuff. And um, perhaps, for example, if the speaker cannot make uh, to a conference or he or she test positive with COVID and they will choose to speak remotely. Um, and sometimes this uh, speeches are those recorded speeches for well-prepared, well-rehearsed events. And these speeches are less redundant, but very dense, very fast. So people tend to uh, speak very fast because, you know, they're not looking at a real audience. Uh, when you're not looking at a real audience, you tend to speak fast without realizing uh, that you are um, too fast. Um, I'm just going to shift gear a little bit uh, by giving you a few examples of how people were trained in other professions. Um, um, I'm a football fan. I also play football. So in football training, uh, 
people are not trained for playing matches only. Even the best players in the world, Leo Messi, Cristiano Ronaldo, they're not just playing matches. Um, and when they're not playing in uh, in a professional league, they do all this day-to-day -day training. It's part of their life. They practice passes, uh, shooting, endurance, tactics. So um, a profession as com as complicated as interpreting should also warrant some kind of integrated training and also training in different components. You cannot say that to practice interpreting, you need to interpret every day. Well, that's what you do, but that's not the only thing you do. Uh, interpreting aside, we need to look at um, the components of interpreting and what we are really doing when we interpret. So that brings me to uh, this uh, um, model. Um, I'm not a researcher, so I'm very careful with these theories, but I think this is a good way to give a breakdown of what interpreters are doing when we say that they are interpreting. Well, there are different tasks uh, from active listening, memory to um, analyzing to production. Um, in this five tasks, uh, production seems the least important because we tend to think that production is the easiest because uh, it's only the final step. If you have the words in your mind, you just say that aloud, but that's not true. Um, in a sense, production could be the most important thing uh, from the audience perspective, because this is the only thing that they will hear from you. Um, so instead of training interpreters, instead of doing interpretation only, we have to train ourselves in um, different components. Namely, we need to train these skills technically separately apart from this integrated practice of interpreting. Um, the trends that I had just talked about mean that um, clients will expect different things. The expectation from one client will be different uh, from the other. Um, and probably some tasks are more demanding uh, um, in some situations. So the clients, uh, what they're looking for would be uh, different. And the interpreters should also be aware of the different ways to work on a particular skill in your, in your skill set like this uh, analytical skills or active listening, depending on the actual assignment we're talking about. So in the next few slides, I'll just bring your attention to some skills that might be required in uh, specific interpreting assignments and how we can uh, work on them. Um, the first one is um, what I can call staying close to the speaker, or if you know the term EVS, that means short EVS. And the examples could be technical meetings, presentations, uh, which contain lots of uh, terms, technical terms. And there would be uh, some conferences uh, like in financial industry, like earnings call or uh, results announcement press conferences where you would expect a lot of numbers. And political discourse is another example because you need to remember this uh, uh, phrases accurately. Um, for example, if you are working at a medical event talking about uh, the new uh, COVID max, uh, vaccines, and the speaker started speaking and he gave a list of vaccines like uh, Sinovac, AstraZeneca, Pfizer, uh, BioNTech. Uh, at that moment, what the audience expected was a clear and accurate list enumeration of the words of the terms that he just mentioned. Um, same thing with political discourse. Like if you heard words like Huan or you need to deliver the English terms accurately. Um, like you blurt out this equivalence without much thinking. So quick response and practice uh, uh, on this pre precise terms 
uh, will be very important because by giving this precise terms, you can win over the uh, um, you can win over the the uh, audience and you can get the uh, trust. So, what exercises could help us achieve that? Uh, we could do some what we call rapid fire questions like Changdati. You can work with your peers, your colleagues, classmates um, with these tools that we all used back in high school, like flashcards, like dance car. And I would recommend a useful tool that I use a lot, uh, which is called Quizlet, um, uh, a quiz and let. I put the link down the page. And, and this is um, a tool for language users to uh, memorize new words. And arguably, uh, they could be uh, used for uh, interpreters as well. And we can do some number practice from time to time, uh, like quick math. Um, you can look for a speech from a website that contains a lot of um, number intensive speeches, um, like uh, IMF or Zhongguo Guojia Tongji Ji or financial reports of listed companies. Um, Instead of doing full interpreting, we only uh, interpret the words and what they stand for. Uh, for example, if you uh, listen to a speech or if you read a speech, you try to look for those uh, numbers and uh, their their collocations. Like uh, if you read and then you you say you say aloud like operating profit. 136 million. Uh, so you do uh, numbers only instead of interpreting the whole speech. Uh, this sounds quite simple, but sometimes we'll just uh, mess them up under stress when we are um, at the heat of interpreting. And uh, quite often, if you miss one of the numbers um, or what the number means, uh, it's kind of domino effect and you will probably mess up the next few sentences as well. So uh, this um, exercises uh, can be done from some uh, from time to time. And another uh, skill that we need to master is eliminating redundancy. Real world speeches tend to be very redundant. Uh, if you watch some um, panel discussions or, or individual interviews, you would probably know that these uh, speakers tend to think while they're talking. So their words, uh, their language might be wordy, might be very verbose, uh, and um, there is a lot of redundancy. And um, he or she will probably give a wishy-washy speech, uh, not knowing what they were actually talking about. But as interpreters, we cannot be carried away by this kind of fuzzy language. We need to like extract the thread from uh, the ambiguity of their speech. Um, and there are filler words. The speakers might co correct themselves from time to time. So um, at this moment, we have two choices. Either we can stay close to the speaker, like we did with terms and numbers, but we will risk being carried away. Um, like um, if you watch this short video clip, uh, I hope you can hear it, and it's only in ten minutes, uh, ten seconds. So I think we can watch it. So I think I think it's important to set a, set a context when when talking about the tightening. You know, I, I actually don't call it tightening, but the you know the regulations that come on the internet sector. So first of all, the China internet technology sector is forty percent of China's GDP. So if you heard that, you would probably observe that there were filler words, uh, there were self corrections. If we stay too close to the speaker, we might end up saying uh, and then we heard him say uh, regulation and then we say and your language becomes something incoherent and, and a bit confusing. So maybe a better strategy would be to wait some time until a clear ideas come up. And if you heard 
um, his introductory word before he really went into the main topic. Um, you could say, 互联网行业监管收紧的问题, uh, so you just sum it up uh, by giving clear expression. Um, and for this kind of uh, speeches, some exercise we can do will first of all include note-taking exercise. Um, I assume some of you have started SI already, but in simultaneous interpreting, uh, the biggest risk we can expect is uh, like you miss the forest for uh, uh, for for the woods, and 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 one thing we can do is to go back to what we learned in consecutive interpreting. We take notes because note taking will force us to analyze a speech. Um, in SI, sometimes we were like dancing with the speaker, but if the speaker is not very coordinated, or if the speaker misses up their steps for nervousness or other reasons, should we move with them? Should we be carried away with them? Of course not. And the second thing um, is what we call who does what questions. You can do that with a speech. You can do that with a news report. You can do that with an editorial uh, that you found in any newspaper. You can do that with speech scripts as well. So what we do is um, like this. So for example, this is an excerpt from an article that I found on South China Morning Post. Um, first of all, you read the news article roughly, get some idea. And um, after reading the whole article, uh, of course, you work with your classmates. And after reading that article, you, you tell your classmate, your practice partner, um, using very short uh, sentences, what the article is about. You tell them in a sentence um, of a structure, which is like who does what. So it reduces the sentence to the bare minimum. Um, for example, uh, the first paragraph would be summarized as Asia is affected by extreme weather. And then for the rest of the passage, uh, you use very short sentences, like temperature rises twice faster where more extreme weather events happen. So uh, instead of managing to get all these subordinated clauses, uh, adjectives, uh, prepositions correctly, you just give um, your practice partner the bare minimum information, but in a clear structure, who does what, or subject, verb, object. So this is a way to uh, look deeper into the structure of a sentence and what it really means. Because in simultaneous interpreting, at the heat of interpreting, we always uh, forget that every idea has a structure. Uh, but at the heat of interpreting, we just forget how to extract the idea. Uh, instead, we were carried away by uh, some patchy information or even unuseful information delivered by the speaker. Uh, uh, I'm going to give you another example, which is not on the slides. The other day, I was interpreting um, a conference uh, about new energy, and the speaker said, It sounds simple. But in that context, you would understand that the second sentence, 之前咱们是没有能源的, means that energy security was not covered in previous party congress reports. And that's what it means. But if you listen to the sentence only and, for, and forget to analyze the whole context, you would probably end up saying that previously we didn't have any resources. Well, that could be a, a, a nightmare because you distorted the information. That's not what the speaker meant. Um, Something else we can practice, prosody, um, meaning sound stress, intonation, or rhythm, or in Chinese, certainly uh, something that interpreter we need to master. Because nowadays, uh, there are more live broadcast events, and um, this is also useful in ceremonial speeches, like uh, a provincial official from China 
uh, giving a toast speech at a banquet held uh, at a foreign country when uh, the delegation is visiting that country. Or uh, these are these motivational speeches like sales conference or uh, insurance company conferences, uh, possibly getting the uh, emotion across, uh, being passionate uh, sometimes um, is what the client is really looking for. So uh, to practice prosody, I'm not an expert in, in, in all these things, but I strongly suggest that you look for some voice coaching courses. Um, I did, uh, um, I, I practiced voices um, in both Chinese and English, and I uh, deliberately looked for some good teachers who uh, could train um, the right way to, to, um, to, to speak. Because with voice coaching, um, there are two things. One, interpreters will need to deliver their speeches at um, pleasant voices, um, as we all know. And the second thing is that interpreters have to work long days, but this is your job, like teaching, like singing, this is a job that involves the use of voice. So that will mean that you need to practice on how to uh, project your voice in a more comfortable yet um, uh, easy way so you will not make an effort to produce sound because that will hurt your vocal cord. Um, and that's also useful to the clients because if you if you work in the morning and your passionate voice is being well received by the audience, however, in the afternoon, your uh, voice fatigue uh, comes through the earphones and being uh, and be picked up by the audience um, not something ideal right because uh, ideally we need to deliver the same level of quality all through the day um for, for that we can sorry uh, for that we can uh, do some voice coaching as we said and we can also choose simple ways by shadowing uh, good speakers. So you choose a speaker of the similar pitch, accent, uh, rhythm uh, as you have, uh, you're comfortable with, and you follow him or her, uh, uh, shadow everything he or she said, feeling the tones, the stress, the rhythm of their speech. Summarization. Um, so this is more for the extreme situations I was talking about. Um, as we said, there are there are these fast speakers in remote conferences. Um, if you try to follow the speaker uh, very closely, you might risk giving very patchy information, incoherent, uh, not seeing the forest for the trees, as we said. Um, and there are other examples, like sometimes the remote conferences uh, will only give you suboptimal or even very poor sound quality. Uh, if you watch the following video clip, you will know <laughs> what I'm talking about. Like this. Um, so, yeah, so uh, for residential finance, what we do is we go through the pertinent sections of the uh, regional sales contract that deal with finance. And then we go through the three different jurisdictional kingdoms. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to uh, uh, put you through this ordeal because it's not very pleasant to hear. Um, you see this choppy and metallic sounds like those phone calls with very poor connection. Uh, they are definitely uh, disasters for simultaneous interpreters. Um, for simultaneous interpreters, this is uh, definitely not... Uh, what we can bear because we listen and speak at the same time. If the original speech is not clear enough, uh, we we can't do that because ob obviously the the incoming audio will have to be at a very good level. So if we are speaking at the same time, we cover part of the uh, incoming speech, we can still uh, hear a distinguishable uh, um, a speech uh, so we can analyze and interpret them into uh, another language. But for this sound quality, uh, which is certainly substandard, uh, we have to adopt a different strategy, meaning we cannot do full SI anymore. 
instead of translating everything, we can do um, something sort of like mini CI. Like uh, if we hear a few sentences, uh, we can, after a few sentences, we just give a brief summary. For example, in the video, um, I really didn't catch everything the lady said, uh, but I almost got the rough idea. So after a few sentences, I could just explain to whoever was listening to me uh, that she was giving a summary of the financial performance of uh, different departments in the uh, company. And when push comes to shove, you will probably have to tell the audience that the sound quality is not good and the interpretation will not be provided until it improves. So these are the solutions, as we said, mini consec, you can do consecutive interpreting. So live commentary is also another technique. Uh, that means instead of interpreting every word, every phrase, you just tell what's going on uh, in, 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 uh, in the conference. It's a bit like these uh, live commentary at sports events uh, when these athletes come into an arena um, the the tv anchors will not translate their words of course they would just tell the audience that these athletes are doing this and that so in extreme situations interpreters can uh, do that as well this is not so much an exercise but uh, just coping strategies now um we can um roughly talk about how we practice because uh in the previous slides, I talked about why we should practice. If we practice individually, uh, the first thing we do is to remember that every time we practice, we need to record ourselves. Um, I'm sure we all have the experience of listening to our own recordings, going through this ordeal of uh, your own recording. Um, but despite that, you should still do that. Otherwise, you cannot find um, this. Um, uh, problems that you need to overcome next time. Um, the perhaps after recording your performance, uh, you can listen to your recording at different time points on the spot just after finishing the exercise. You can listen to a dual track recording, checking your accuracy and completeness. But after some time, you just put the recording aside and leave it there for like one day or two days. And after that, you listen to your recording by only listening to your delivery uh, without the original speech. By doing that, you can easily detect what was going wrong. Some filler words, uh, not pleasant voice, uh, hasty, shaky, not sounding confident, etc. And 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 and. You can, you can even do that every day. And for, for professional interpreters, we can also do that because sometimes when we are in a conference, we didn't realize uh, what our interpretation sounds like because we were uh, supposedly immersed in the original speech. Um, and we can also um, build this habit of uh, maintaining a bilingual phrase book this, I, I'm sure you, you've all done that because we are language learners. Uh, and if we find a good phrase, a good expression in, in one language, we just note it down and make this bilingual uh, glossary. Uh, uh, in a word, we just keep a curious mind and inquisitive mindset. Uh, we find all these resources from news reports, TV programs. Uh, we, uh, if UK has a new prime minister. We remember his name uh, in, in, in Mandarin, in Cantonese, and in English. So we uh, do that every day. And uh, sometimes if you read interesting things in one language, um, so uh, the other day I was reading some WeChat articles and I saw this interesting news about Fan uh, Xiang Mo Lin. You know, this guy went to a restaurant and instead of uh, paying 900 and uh, uh, 900 RMB and the 
50 cents or something, the restaurant asked him to pay 901 yuan, uh, which was um, uh, not reasonable. So Fan Xiang Mo Lin, I spent some time thinking about the English interpretation, and that could probably be uh, rounded up um, instead of rounded down. And you can also collect these words from work, because professional interpreters uh, work in 15 at each 15 minutes or 20 minutes, we take turns. And after each turn, um, there must be some words that you missed up in the previous round. And very quickly, you uh, note them down and look look up the unknown words in the dictionary or any online resources. We can even build a bilingual uh, phrasebook um, of some useful phrases for presentations and conferences. Uh, very simple things, even they're almost like cliches, like um, without further ado, let's invite this XYZ speaker or uh, thank you to the organizer and ask to talk about this XYZ topic or by a show of hands, how many of you have seen this research um, or um, in the interest of time, we'll leave questions till the end. So think like that, because this uh, phrases will appear in the presentation like thousands of times um, in your working experience. And it's uh, um, it, it's not the smartest thing to do by uh, spending your brain power on them each time you heard something like that. And the last thing that we can do in individual practice is called mental rehearsal. Um, we are all very busy interpreters. Um, but we can't practice uh, only when we have time to practice. So this is a skill often used by professional athletes. It's also called um, instructional self-talk. Instead of doing the practice, uh, uh, actual practice, you um, picture yourself doing the practice in your mind, the best practice you can expect. So giving yourself kind of psychological hint, and that will improve your actual uh, performance. So SI, of course, is different from uh, sports because SI is much less of a routine. We have different speakers to follow we, every time these um, topics are different. And um, But what we can do is to listen to a short speech, even with our headphones, we can do that for five to 10 minutes on the way to work and doesn't um, disturb others. So instead of interpreting aloud, you interpret mentally. You do everything in your mind, analyzing, active listening, um, um, extracting information, summarization, uh, everything except for delivery. Uh, so you will not disturb others. And, and so, for example, if you are going to interpret for a, uh, an American entrepreneur um, one day, and instead of just practicing um, mentally how you would interpret this entrepreneur, you can also listen to some Chinese entrepreneurs talk so you can understand what is the equivalent of uh, people like that in another uh, language speaking world or another culture. And you can um, collect some traits of how these speakers uh, will speak. Um, so you can build uh, your own style of speaking because as interpreters, we're like actors constantly playing different roles. And it, this also points to the importance of mock conferences because uh, in a mock conference, um, I'm sure we, we've all done mock conferences. Um, it's the rare opportunity that you can play another role, um, a real speaker um, instead of an interpreter. If you are, uh, for example, a Chinese academic in a mock conference, and that will help you a lot um, um, with the uh, style um, of speaking. And imagine if you are interpreting for an America academic the other day, uh, the experience of being a Chinese speaker at a mock conference will be of great help. Um, apart from individual practice, we can also do group practice if um, uh, that's the situation for you. And 
if we have a small group, we can do what we call pure customer exercise. If you are doing SI, um, you can invite your um, peers to listen to your interpretation only without listening to uh, the original speech. If you are doing consecutive, uh, you can um, ask them, uh, ask your practice partners to be absent from the room for some time when the original speech was delivered and you invite them back to the room when you are doing consecutive interpreting so they can listen to your interpretation without understanding the original speech so they can be more likely to find your problems with delivery coherence um, or terms etc and it, it, if if it's possible, you can also you can even invite some lay audience, interp uh, people that are not interpreters, to listen to you uh, interpret. So um, you can invite them to point your problems. And and the biggest caveat I'm going to give is one thing at a time, because sometimes we're just too ambitious. I'm going to interpret for an hour today. I will be practicing, practicing. I will be achieving 10,000 hours someday. So I become an expert. But um, actually, we need to uh, focus on one component of interpretation or one task at a time in order to be good at it. Otherwise, we will be just overwhelmed by the daunting task of interpreting because there is a huge level of coordination involved. And if you have to manage everything um, together, you would probably uh, mess the whole thing up uh, instead of achieving your intended objective. Um, these are some softwares we can use to record ourselves. Uh, of course, for mono, uh, mono track recording, it's easy just interpret with the headphones on and use your cell phone as a recorder to record your own interpretation. If you need to do um, a dual track recording, there are two very useful tools, Audacity and Audio Hijack, which I often use myself. Uh, and you, if you have time, you can try them out. Um, other tips, uh, warm up is often ignored. Athletes warm up before they play a match. Uh, singers warm up before they get onto the stage, but interpreters sometimes don't warm up. Um, we, when we are asked to interpret a conference, it's quite often that the first time you speak on the very day is when you start to interpret. And that will increase the likelihood of messing up the first 10 minutes of your interpreting assignment because your vocal cords, your facial and uh, oral muscles are not uh, warmed up yet. And, and you will probably have slips of tongue, um, having trouble pronouncing um, particular words or enunciating um, in the first 10 minutes. Uh, well, on the other hand, the first 10 minutes of a speech might uh, be the most important part. So it's not the best thing to mess up. Um, secondly, we need some techniques to protect our voice. Of course, as I said, I'm not a voice coaching expert. So uh, just some very simple tips. Um, when you are really interpreting, uh, make sure you uh, keep yourself high, hydrated, um, instead of drinking coffee or tea uh, right before your interpreting uh, assignment or practice, uh, you drink water instead just to um, uh, um, uh, be nice to your vocal cord and, and uh, oral muscles. You can also uh, uh, eat a slice of uh, uh, apple, for example, just to stimulate your saliva so your mouth will not be dry, uh, which uh, makes interpreting more difficult. And aside uh, from interpreting, uh, we need to work out doing exercises because mental exercise uh, can be complemented by physical exercise in a nice way as um, aerobics will uh, stimulate blood circulation, as we all know, and it will also boost our um, mental um, uh, facilities. Um, we all understand that interpreting programs are definitely not the end, but the start of a new journey. So uh, after 
leaving this program, I assume you will look for different jobs in um, conference interpretation market, both as in in house or freelance interpreters, and um, and that means you will need to uh, connect with people with the uh, same idea. You need to uh, keep up with new trends like uh, RSI and other technologies. Um, and you will also enhance your resume. Uh, uh, as students, we don't have much experience, but at least we can show who we are uh, by putting there these uh, um, volunteer work we've done, or uh, very nicely, the voice sample of uh, you doing interpreting so your potential clients will know you better like on LinkedIn now we have the new, this new functionality of introducing ourselves with a short sound clip um, but most importantly of course improve our in interpreting skills uh, uh, interpret interpreting is a lifelong experience um, and it's lifelong learning as well uh, as we all know if we compare uh, fresh graduates and professional interpreters surprisingly you would probably find there there are very little difference in general knowledge and linguistic performance because we all know that uh we we had the language skills and we we have the skills we 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 had it even before we got into this program and our general knowledge uh, doesn't make much difference because um, we all know who the newest uh, Prime Minister of the UK is, and we understand uh, the common issues of the world, like climate change. So there is not much difference in general knowledge and linguistic performance between graduates and professional interpreters. But there is a huge gap to fill when it comes to specific knowledge, industry knowledge, and stress management. For professional interpreters, we make mistakes like we mess things up, we missed this term, we uh, missed a number, and we didn't catch the speaker because it was too fast or not very clear. We do all these things, but um, very quickly, we uh, um, pick up ourselves from these uh, pieces and, and, and then resume interpreting. But for fresh graduates, uh, this can be a huge barrier to overtake uh, to 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 overcome um that's why we need to uh expand our paths to professional interpreting through different directions and this is what we call cpd or continuous professional development um different possibilities from retour skills interpreting to an, another language uh, your your non-native language we can work on our skills of teaching interpreting if being an interpreter trainer is what you're looking for. And we can practice note taking skills. Sometimes if we do a lot of SI, our CI techniques uh, will fade. Uh, we work on business skills, voice coaching technology, and stress management. As we said, there is a huge gap between professionals and graduates in stress management. And of course, specific knowledge, uh, if you need to dwell uh, on a specific industry, uh, like medical interpreting or legal interpreting, there are courses to take. So, because um, we were a bit late uh, at the start of the uh, seminar, and I, I tried to skip a little bit, uh, and I'm sure some points that I covered would be uh, interesting in the way that uh, you will uh, have some questions. Um, so I don't know how much time we can allow for questions, but... Um, now we're happy to uh, take the questions from 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 the floor or or the online audience. Right. Um. Thank you very much, Leo, um, for making time to speak to us when you are so busy. But actually, in the last uh, three years, I've got glimpses of you, um, yeah, mostly through moment. Uh, and I learned that you have been. But uh, um. Right, you continue to have, have an exciting life as a conference interpreter. And um, I really congratulate you on all you have achieved um, since um, we saw you last time. Thank you, Vicky. Thank you for right, the And uh, the sound quality that you delivered as a remote speaker is very, very high. Uh, we are it's very good to know. Yes. It's good to yes. know. 
Yeah, also what, what you have um, told us, that's a wonderful testimony given by a professional interpreter, and that's going to be very enlightening for our, our students. Uh, you say that throughout our career as interpreters, we still need to exercise, uh, just like uh, football players. And I think the reasons that you put forward is extremely compelling. I'm sure that our students, um, our colleagues got lots of questions for you. Um, so right, who would like to ask the first question? Okay, uh, Frank, I think it'd be easier if you come closer to the computer. Hi, Leo. Uh, hi, hi, Frank. Uh, yeah, nice time. to see you, gang. Nice yeah, to see you. Okay. long time um, no see. Thank you very much for this very informative um, talk. I have two questions. Uh, the first one is asked, asking on behalf of some of the pr practitioners, including myself, doing uh, remote sessions. Nowadays, there are a lot of remote meetings. Uh, I was wondering, uh, when you are doing remote in interpreting meetings, how do you interact with your online partners? Because mm. I, I assume it has been a very different experience from working in the booth where you can see each other, you can, there are a lot of tricks to play along in the booth. However, on, on, on Zoom or on other platforms, sometimes it's really difficult to, to hear your partner speaking or there are some other technical issues. So my first question is ask for myself and uh, some of the colleagues, uh, what are the uh, tips or suggestions you have for interacting with your post partners um, um, on this online session, in this, for this online sessions. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so uh, very briefly, we, we, we have to admit the fact that um, we can't expect to see each other in every remote session. I mean, um, we have different tendencies. Some people would just accept to be sane in a separate conference just between uh, booth mates. For example, if you are interpreting on Zoom, uh, like we are doing now, you can have another Zoom meeting or a WeChat video chat uh, between you and your booth mates. So you can talk as we are talking now, seeing each other, uh, waving hands, doing all kinds of gestures. And if it's not a problem. Um, but nowadays, people tend to hide themselves behind screens and they don't want to be seen. I understand some colleagues um, would very much like to uh, work in pyjamas, uh, sitting comfortably in their uh, armchair in a study. Um, that's uh, also understandable. Uh, in that situation, we would probably have to use uh, um, uh, text chats uh, like uh, WeChat or WhatsApp. Um, but the tricky thing is that instead of managing uh, this uh, handovers, uh, like we do in a real booth, uh, you, you can do facial gestures um, and you can do gestures, all kinds of things. So in remote situations, these things obviously become more difficult. So we cannot uh, just um, hand over at the precise point that we intended to make use of for this uh, handovers. Um, we need to set some protocols beforehand. For example, be before the conference, you could uh, talk with your booth mate, um, negotiating on the protocol on how to um, um, hand over um, the, the session. For example, if the speech has uh, like if the conference has 20 speeches each 15 minutes, and then you can say to your booth mates, perhaps let's just divide uh, the workload and you take care of 10 speeches and, and I will be taking care of the rest of the speeches. So instead of managing uh, handovers with precise time slots, uh, we divide our workload um, in, 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 in other ways. Um, yeah, and, but but these are not very difficult techniques to to grasp because if you are um, comfortable with uh, sending uh, WeChat messages, like um, if I uh, text me, it means it's my turn, uh, and if your booth mate replied um, okay, that means he or she uh, can 
um, uh, hand it over to you. Uh, but we need to be very precise on that. We need to be very strict on that. Uh, meaning, if you text OK, you need to shut up immediately. Uh, otherwise, it will just mess up because we could risk uh, double talk if we do that. Um, but, 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 but anyway, if if you find a technique that you're comfortable with um, over a short period of time, you would be definitely accustomed to a new mode of working. Uh, and uh, honestly speaking, I don't I don't think it makes a huge. Uh, it, 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 there is not much difference between. Uh, handing over remotely and doing that in a real booth uh, if you do that a lot of times. I'm sure we are quite into that already uh, with uh, three years of practice. Oh, thank you very much, Leo. Um, and my second question is about uh, self-practice you just mentioned in your talk. Yeah. Uh, I know there are many students who are confused about um, the uh, materials that they can use, especially during their self-practice, instead of having uh, been lectured in classes or other training sessions. Um, do you have some suggestions for uh, the students, for, for instance, for the beginner's level or intermediate level or more advanced level, mm. when they're working on their own, are there any criteria or some tips for them to choose um, the most appropriate materials to work with. And a follow up question is on these uh, uh, note taking skills, because um, a lot of students have been uh, given instructions on the importance of note taking, uh, yeah. long some consecutives or even short some consecutives. However, um, I, I, I'm wondering if there is a, a balance in their self practice to work. Um, uh, how much time and energy should they devote to working with note taking? Because, uh, as you know, less uh, we often talk about less is more. Mm -hmm. When you devote too much to the uh, note taking instead of working with your brain, there will be some problems uh, mm -hmm. in your performance. Uh, so, so the so the second question is with the material we can yep. use and the note note taking as uh, as how we can strike a balance. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, on a material, um, I, I think if possible, uh, the the students or even fresh graduates uh, should always engage their trainers to some extent when they need to practice, at least at the first years into the profession. I'm sure the trainers will be happy to help them. I mean, it, it's not that their trainers will have to uh, teach them continuously after their graduation. That's not possible because you have a new intake of a uh, new cohort of students to teach. But at least you can give them some pointers. Uh, for example, if the student asked for um, some good materials for practicing a simultaneous interpreter, uh, interpreting with um, um, uh, like simul with text, uh, what are the good resources? And the teacher could point the way. Well, look for this YouTube channel, look for that website, or uh, you share with them like links to 10 speeches. So you're not supervising the entire speech process, but you pointed uh, the way. So they were not um, um, like lose the direction um, um, to some extent, and they can, uh, when they have problems, they can always go back to you. Um, so I think the trainers, if possible, can offer uh, some minimal help with that. Um, but speaking of different levels, uh, we have this websites um, uh, like Skeek, Speech Repository, and other uh, websites established by um, uh, follow interpreters. These speeches often categorized into different difficulties, so you can roughly understand um, what, what level of speech uh, I'm not practicing. Um, having said that, practicing interpreting is not um, a protected uh, a job, at least not for not for the long run. In 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 a in in an environment like in a school. You are well protected by your your trainers and all these elements in this 
environment. So uh, you will not risk practicing uh, too much material that is too daunting for you at current state. But trust me, the real world would be like a jungle and there are all wild things going on. And that's part of interpreter's life. If you happen to practice a speech, which is extremely difficult, overwhelming, and there are still ways to make use of it. Um, for example, as I said, interpreting can be uh, divided into different tasks, active listening, analyzing uh, production, etc. If if the speech is really difficult, let's imagine there is a strongly accented speech uh, with technical terms, fast speed, um, uh, not logical uh, delivery. So everything uh, that is nightmare to the interpreters happens in this speech. And the first time could be very daunting. It's overwhelming. You are like upset. But the second time, maybe you can dissect the speech by doing the active interpreting first. Well, let me just try to listen to every and each word clearly. And the second step, okay, let's work on analyzing. What are the use um, useful parts, what is the um, uh, wordy part, and what is the redundant expression. So we analyze, like we extract the main idea of each part of the speech. Uh, we can retell, we can do consecutive, we can do all sorts of things. And then uh, we do a prosody, like you know what the speech is about, you know what it means, and then we can practice our output by delivering the speech in a clear, uh, well, uh, well-pronounced way. So a, a difficult speech practiced in different components would not seem too daunting uh, if you dissect it into uh, different parts. And that's also a way to uh, deal with a difficult speech. And by the way, the beauty of doing this is that you can build your confidence instead of being overwhelmed uh, by a speech. So any speech can be done in, in, in this way, and um, however difficult it is. Um, as for note-taking, I think sometimes we are, um, note-taking is like SI, because if you take notes, um, obviously you're trying to, uh, at the beginning of note-taking, we always uh, try to note everything down. Like in SI, we always try to translate everything we heard. So we are doing these things along the same lines. Um, but we all know that if we note down everything we heard immediately, or if we interpret everything we heard immediately, we will risk being carried away by the speaker and saying something incoherent and confusing. And um, if that's the case, we can go back to the previous step before note-taking, and that's analyzing. Because we, we, we take bad notes because we are not good at analyzing a speech. Uh, that's why the um, classmates, the, the practice partners can always question uh, your 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 delivery. For example, you, you can practice with a speech script or, or a news article, but instead of taking notes, you just read the speech uh, by retelling your practice partner what each and every part means. If the partner says, okay, uh, you're not quite clear with that. I don't understand. Uh, it's not quite clear. I, I, I didn't get who does what when the thing happened. Um, so this will force uh, the uh, in interpreting students to think in an analytical way instead of, you know, uh, noting down everything that's coming to them. Because uh, obviously, if it's a speech, there has to be ideas and there have to be um, some clear structure along the speech. So instead of doing note-taking only, uh, if you have problems in analytical skills, you practice analyzing before note-taking. And if you have problem in analyzing, then you practice active listening. So it's always going back to the first step uh, if you find problems um, catching up in the current step that you're working on. Well, thank you very much for these very instructive suggestions. Uh, I think 
there are some other questions from our colleagues, so I will uh, leave the floor to them. And I look forward to seeing you in person, Leo. Thank you very much. Me too. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, right, who would like to ask the next question? Hi, Leo. Hi. Thank you for your wonderful lecture. It's very inspiring. And and thank I you. Two, I have two questions. And the first is uh, just now you mentioned self practice. Yep. And do you have any suggestions on improving memory and the coordination? Mm -hmm. uh, are there any specific exercises in this? Yeah. Way? So um, memory is like straightforward, but uh, let's define coordination first, because by uh, definition, uh, consecutive interpretation and simultaneous interpretation are both tasks that will require a high level of coordination. Well, um, let me talk about memory first. Um, if you listen to a lot of speeches, I'm, I'm sure you did because you're all interpreting students, um, you would find that all speeches tend to be um, organized in certain structures. Um, some speakers will give an example to illustrate the problem, and he will then uh, talk about the problem and then some solutions, the problem and solutions probably will be one of the um, uh, common structure or framework, if you like, uh, in speeches. And the other speaker might be talking things in a chronological way, like if he was talking about the changes that happened after uh, China's reform and opening up, then the speech might be conducted in a um, timeline in a, uh, in a chronological way. So if you observe these structures, uh, you would probably understand that everything can be categorized into uh, some sort of structure or part of the speech can be categorized into a structure. And structure aside, there are different elements in a speech. Um, in a speech, there might be examples, there might be arguments, so telling an idea, um, for example, I agree with that, I don't agree with that. Uh, there are examples uh, like numbers, maybe like the research says, or the magazine, this academic magazine journal says, according to this journal, uh, the population of China uh, saw this trend of aging, things like that. So you have examples and you have stories, um, maybe the speaker in order to add colors to his speech, would tell some interesting stories. Um, if you have these structures and elements, um, you will find different ways to memorize them. Of course, for numbers and um, uh, technical words and very specific examples, um, you make use of your notes. Um, but if it's a story, uh, you can listen to the story attentively and use visualization. If the speaker is telling you about um, uh, the new design of a school teaching building in, on your campus, and, and then you visualize the image. So there are different ways to memorize things. So um, if, if you practice with your classmates, the first thing you do is to uh, think about the structure that the speech or parts of the speech uh, are made. Uh, you can discuss them. Um, you can draw like mind maps, not, not just uh, interpreting notes, but mind maps like bullet points or flow charts, things like that. Uh, if you do the things, this will give you a good start um, of memorizing the speech because sometimes we're too immersed in details and this will uh, prevent us from seeing the big picture. Uh, a lot of the times, the, the audience is expecting the idea, the big picture. I'm not saying that details are not important, they're not, they are important, but details should not be kept at the cost of missing the bigger picture. Because if you miss the bigger picture, uh, uh, things will um, collapse and the audience will not 
get anything at all that is um, uh, not ideal. Um, on your second question on uh, coordination, um, like like uh, what I told Frank, and um, there is a different step in interpreting. So in in consecutive, it, it it things happen one after another. Like you have active listening and you analyze. Well, this happened at the same time, but you take notes and you deliver. Uh, there is a time lag already. But in simultaneous, everything happens at the same time, but they're not. Actually, they're not at this, uh, happening at the same time. You listen to like one sentence or three sentences, and then you analyze them. But at the same time, you're listening to the next group of three sentences, and then you analyze them. But at the same time, you are probably delivering the interpretation of the first group of sentence you already heard. So it's like happened uh, in a staggered way. Um, if you find problems in coordination, well, I have to finish this before I do that, then that means you have a weak link in part of these components. And that means you need to work on the weak link first so it will not drag down uh, the speed of the whole process. Let me give you an example. If you have problems with accents, for example, if it's a very easy speech, but if it's told by um, an African speaker or an Indian speaker, you have problem understanding that, of course, uh, you're not going to do um, a good job in interpreting. And that means your active listening part has a weak link. So let me work on active listening first, right? I ask myself, can I understand each and, and every word these Indian speakers said? If that's not, let, let me not in, start interpreting first, right? Let me just listen to uh, his speech or similar speeches um, to an extent where I can understand almost each word he said. Uh, for example, if, if the Indian speaker said a word, and you didn't understand, but later on you checked the speech script and you found that the word is something you already knew. Well, that means you have a problem in active listening. So you listen to some speeches, similar speeches, similar speeds um, and accents uh, to a point that you can understand every and each word uh, this speaker with the particular accent says, and then you start the next step. So it's always going back to the weakest link and and deal with it before uh, continuing with the other steps. Okay, thank you. And thank you. Uh, I have one more question. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's sure. About, uh, stress management. Mm. Um, uh, I'm sure as an as a very professional interpreter, you won't feel uh, stressful easily right now. Uh, when you were a student, interpreting student. Mm, what kind of element or to say problem triggers uh, do you think uh, make you stressful? And how did you cope with these uh, problem triggers? Um, well, uh, and if you remember one of the slides uh, that have shown the biggest gap between fresh graduates and, uh, and uh, uh, professional interpreters uh, may take place in stress management and and sometimes in delivery as well, uh, but stress management uh, is is uh, is the most common uh, uh, difference. Um, stress can be um, like uh, triggered um, with with different things. Um, sometimes it's not as complicated as we would think. At the very beginning of your interpreting career, you would, would probably think, okay, difficult terms in, in, in different industries, technical terms, and a huge number of terms I need to remember. There is a huge level of knowledge, um, but it's not. Uh, in, interpreters often uh, messed up very simple things. Like if the speaker said, um, I'll just tell you a story about what happened in my hometown. And he started to tell a story. And you would probably find that the story is even more difficult to interpret than a very formal political discourse. So 
stress can be triggered uh, by different things. And as, as student interpreters, of course, you need to review your performance after a session, a conference, a, a, a class, etc., cetera, um, and find the weakest link and work on it, as I said. But more importantly, you need to give this psychological hint to yourself um, by looking at the role of uh, interpreting in a broader social context. Well, I'm saying... Um, as students, most of the time, our mindset is that we are students and we are there sitting in the classroom, being checked by our uh, classmates and trainer. This is our mindset. But in a real conference, it's not true. You're not there being checked by the audience and the organizer or a client. It's not their job. They will not check everything you said with everything that has been said by the original speaker. They're not doing that. So when things drag you down, like, uh, like speed, accent, technical terms, you always keep the big picture in your mind. I am there to help these people communicate. If I cannot get that technical word, can I get the basic uh, meaning? Can I get the big picture? If I cannot tell a number, uh, can I tell the trend? Can I at least tell the audience if the company's financial performance is going up or down? Let me just give them the bare minimum information because if you miss a detail and you feel guilty about that, it will mess up the whole thing and your interpretation um, will not be, not, not just not pleasant to hear, it, it will not be usable anymore. Because imagine if you are talking to someone uh, and he, instead of telling what happened yesterday, um, he just told you some patchy moments of um, what happened yesterday, like a number here, a noun there, uh, a verb there, but they're not connected. This is not what we want. So um, instead of trying your best to get everything uh, uh, correctly, just bear the big picture in your mind. I need to tell them what happened. I need to tell them um, uh, who does what, and which is the basic minimum of of every and uh, and each idea. If we cannot give them uh, these details, let me just keep the bare minimum. We cannot just give them the de give them the details, but miss out. Uh, the, the main trunk of the message. And uh, lastly, please remember that you are there for a reason. Even if you are just a, a starting interpreter, uh, tell yourself, without your help, this audience, these people, members of the audience, will not understand even 1% of the speech. But because you're, of your presence, they would be able to understand like 50%, 60%, 70%. So always look at the positive side. I mean, uh, I'm not saying that we can leave out the details uh, uh, outright. Uh, that's the thing we do after the conference, after the practice, uh, when we review our own performance. But when you are in the middle of the meeting, you need to have this positive mindset by telling yourself, I am there for a reason. I have my road to, to to play and uh, they, they're not inviting me uh, for, for, for doing nothing at all. I'm there to help them communicate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leo. It's very helpful. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Leo. And thank you, Eunice. I think uh, due to time limit, uh, I asked um, the last question, may I? Yeah. Um, Leo, you are in a unique role you have delivered uh, all these goodies from the real world to us. Um, right, my question is, right, you are you have been a student and now you mm. are a trainer. Right? Yeah. So what do you find the most useful and the most important in classroom training? Uh, you mean in my training or, or in the training that I... Right, in general. So, uh, okay. Yeah, so how to make the best of um, the student's time in the classroom? So it got, um, you have told us all these things that um, they need to do when they enter the real world. Yeah. Uh, in the classroom, say of your experience mm. as a student and as a trainer, 
um, or the most useful and the most important? Mm. Um, I think if you observe how an interpreting class um, is organized, uh, there are always different moments where students uh, demonstrate different levels of participation and even different levels of energy. Like at the beginning of every session, uh, if you have two sessions for, uh, if you have two separate sessions for bigger session in a class, and for the first half, uh, for the first 10 minutes in the first half session, uh, make the full use of it because it's the most energetic moment of the students and you need use them for practice, not other things, not giving feedback, not giving uh, introduction, not telling theories, etc. Because um, as professional interpreters, you need to experience this stress of interpreting a speech right away when you get into a, a conference venue, right? And we can imitate that, we can simulate that in, in an interpreting class as well. So for the first 10 minutes, uh, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever, make good use of uh, them for real practice. And then uh, just after that, when our memory is still fresh, we give feedback. Um, but we don't just give feedback based on on their uh, um, uh, based on your notes, but based on their uh, real performance. Meaning, you need to replay uh, the recording of students' interpretation, and that's also a training process because being able to uh, go through the ordeal, uh, if you like, of listening to your own interpretation and let's say being on good terms with that um, will teach you a lot because if you're comfortable with yourself with your interpretation or if you are uh, embarrassed by your interpretation that's part of the learning process and that will build a stronger mind and that's part of the stress management as well and then when the energy goes down at the uh, last one third of uh, each session we can think about other things like peer discussion, giving better strategies, theories, um, and and then uh, uh, some further practice, uh, some some suggestions on on uh, individual after class practice, etc. So we uh, use the time of um, an interpreting class in the roughly similar way as how we organize a conference. Right? You have fifteen or twenty. Uh, minute rounds and after that uh, you review your own performance and on your way back home uh, you think about how you interpret so it's almost uh, done in the same way uh, because in this way we can make good use of uh, students uh, participation and their their level yeah, yeah. of energy yes thank you uh, yeah that's about uh, how to organize um, one yeah. single um, class yeah. A class yeah. meeting. Um, right at the beginning of your talk, you um, mentioned the difference between the classroom and the real world. And something that uh, we get in the classroom that you don't often get in the real world mm. is assessment and feedback. Do you mm. think that assessment is uh, good for the students' efficacy? Um, good for students, say, for example, stress management? Yeah. Uh, feedback? Or do you uh, think that uh, it's got negative impact or right on the student's ability um, to manage stress and confidence? Do you think that uh, right assessment in general is a good thing or a bad thing? Um, I, I, I would not argue that it's a bad thing. Of course, assessment is good, uh, but we need to distinguish uh, peer assessment, trainer assessment, and how clients and the real world evaluates uh, interpreters um, because peer feedback is um, almost instinctive. Uh, it, it, it's it's partial picking on a, a few um, uh, intuitive uh, 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 indications, but trainer feedback is more like all round feedback from accuracy to to uh, production. Um, however, client feedback would be a totally different thing because they will look at interpretation 
uh, from a bigger, uh, from a broader perspective. Uh, for a 10 minute speech, it's useful to give all round feedback. But for days work, um, imagine that you have a mock conference someday in this semester, and the students will only be assessed um, by um, looking at their performance for the whole day, not the speech in this 10 minutes, not the performance in the other 10 minutes. So if you look at the details too much, um, you will lose a uh, you will lose the clue of how the student will perform in general because obviously a student may 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 do well in some parts of the speech but less well in other parts of the speech but that doesn't mean that the student is not a good interpreter uh, if he or she is not doing a good job in that 10 minutes uh, in in a technical presentation so only by giving them other chances uh, other than uh, classroom sessions like more conferences uh, or maybe internships uh, or or a dummy booth uh, you need to complement classroom practice with other forms so uh, they will um, both assess the performance at micro level but also at macro levels yeah, um, thank you. Thank you very much for the very enriching, uh, very informative um, lecture. Right now, I think I'll invite Professor Lee um, to do a wrap up. All right. Okay. Thank you, Liu, for this fascinating talk. I think uh, it's really um, very uh, privilege of all of us to have the opportunity to hear you, you know, share, hear you talk about your your experience of doing learning, interpreting, um, doing interpreting, and also um, you know, keep on sort of uh, improving yourself, holding your your skills uh, of interpreting. So I think all these will be very very useful to all of us. So um, really, I, I I feel grateful to you as well. Um, well, it's being a long evening for you. Now for us, we have three hours. So, um, but I think uh, really thank you very much for taking the time to speak to all of us. And I'm sure like my, uh, our students here and also all those uh, um, uh, audience online are uh, grateful because uh, I think we've all learned a lot. And as I discussed with you earlier, before the, 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 the talk, you know, we, we actually have plans for further collaboration, most likely probably early part of the next year, when um, we might be, um, you know, um, the conditions perm permitting then holding the uh, grand finale of that, uh, uh, what's the problem? I don't remember the cross street um, interpreting contest. Yeah. So that's a good time when like you will and, and your colleagues um, from the Ike Vega, right, yeah. will be speaking to all of us and on uh, professional development, particularly. So, um, well, so uh, I, I look forward to, uh, you know, our next meeting, uh, hopefully. In person. Uh, on site, <laughs> yes, right. So that'll be great. So I, I well, look for that too. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, well, so we'll stay in touch and. Yes. Right, so now this is a good time for all of us to uh, put our hands together again just to express our thanks to you. Thanks, Bill. Mm. So and thank now. you all very much. I, yeah. I wish you um, a pleasant study experience in this university and also uh, a successful career uh, as, as interpreters. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay, bye now. Bye now.